We're also going to be joined now by Clover co-founder Amber Balde and David Treat of Accenture. Are both of them online now? Let's see. Hey guys. Hi. There we Hi. are. Thanks everybody for joining. Great Thank to be here. Me. Amber, I'm going to start with you. You run a private company, a startup. What is your involvement with this Presidio Principles project and what do you hope to accomplish with that? Sure, I joined the uh, World Economic Forum's Blockchain Council, um, I guess a year and a half ago at this point. And so this was one of the projects that when we all met and were discussing what could be uh, really helpful to um, the community and our work with larger organizations uh, and help both big guys and little guys at the same time, uh, working on these principles was one of the things. So I signed up for that project and have kind of helped uh, curate it from, from the beginning there. Gotcha. And Sheila, what do you think that we need to do or to think about in order to not have blockchain technology usher in a kind of crypto dys, uh, dystopia? What are the principles that we need to make front and center and make sure are codified in either law or practice? Yeah, well, I think building off the conversation that I just had with Marvin and Aza, you know, we were, I'll give you a bit of the kind of the background and why we thought this was an important project. So we convened our Global Blockchain Council last year, as Amber notes, about a year and a half ago. And this came up just as this idea that this technology does have the capability of unlocking a new way of engaging. Um, it, the peer-to-peer -peer kind of capability alone has ethical implications. Like what does it mean to actually remove intermediaries in certain contexts? Like what can that engender, both positive and negative? And so I think uh, the idea that tech is neutral is something that we just generally don't believe. We think there's a context in which you deploy that. And so uh, the council basically determined that a set of principles, guidance principles, that would provide kind of a directional notion, right? They're not something that is, they're not legally binding, you know, they're not like a must do, but they give this direction, a strong sense of the direction and which way to go to make sure that this technology does not lead to the dystopian world that you know, we were kind of talking about on the last panel and that you're, you're alluding to. Um, and I think that those, those general principles at a high level uh, are, are around things like transparency and accountability, around thinking about privacy, and just making sure that we're baking into every sort of technical decision or design decision, those choices. And we're doing that consciously and mindfully and not just kind of letting the enthusiasm <laughs> for the, the technology you know, drive us rather than really thinking through what the consequences might be. Gotcha. David, can you help me visualize what it means to live in a decentralized future? My body is pretty centralized and so is my household. So what does it mean when we think about a decentralized future? I, um, I, I, actually, I actually don't like the suffix on that word because um, I, cause I, uh, I, think, I think you're raising the key problems, right? The, so to be decentralized would mean that there, you, know, you lack someone who can fix it when it goes wrong. Uh, you mm -hmm. lack someone who's going to, to curate how something evolves and modernizes and innovates. Uh, you, you know, you, the, so um, the, this whole space in, in terms of the work that we're doing is not about achieving, is, is not about removing all intermediaries. It's seriously challenging the intermediary structure. So I think the future is with, with, with pushing on that dynamic and, and making sure that if, you know, the intermediaries that are in play are adding value, they're not simply moving, you know, data from left hand to right hand, or not, they're not, you know, providing a spurious service, but they're adding value, then we've achieved the right outcome. But, at the, but in all cases, when you think about how you operate these systems, how you, you, you are a consumer advocate, how you protect people's rights and interests, how you, be, how you continue to modernize and evolve, uh, if you don't have someone who, ha who plays that operate role um, and supports the, the societal choices that we have around how to protect people, uh, I think we're in serious trouble. So, um, so I, I don't like decentralized with an ED on the end. I like it with the IZE -E on the end uh, okay. and really push those boundaries. But what does that mean, right? So for example, I probably use Google every single day anytime I have a question and I might use something like Twitter or Facebook when it is I'm trying to connect with friends or family that aren't physically in the room with me. When we think about a decentralized future, I also probably use like Venmo or other kinds of financial apps that all of these are controlled or operated by central parties I rely on, as you mentioned. So when you think about a decentralized future, does that mean that, um, for example, they wouldn't be collecting my data as their business model? Does that mean that I would continue doing the things I do, but I would have more choices of, of recourse or agency if I wanted to take on some of the heavy lifting myself? What, it, what does it mean 
for an average person? Yeah, I, I think um, if I split that, if I split that into two parts, I think we're in a really exciting time in that the technology that we have available can configure to what policy and social and personal choices we want to make in ways that it never could before. Right. So it's, you know, I think too frequently in the conversations that we have, we take a very blunt binary approach, right? Someone can, someone can, can, you know, see my data or surveil me or audit me or they can't. Right. And, and mm -hmm. none of, none of the world we live in is that binary. Right? Yeah, so, that's not true at all. <laughs> yeah, so, it, you know, but the, I think the most interesting part and the really, and the really valuable policy discussions that are underway and, and law and regulatory and consumer advocacy conversations that are underway are how do we best configure the technology that we're building in alignment with those values, the social values for the system that we want to, we want to be in. Um, and and the, the bright spot is that the technology is getting, giving us better and better ways to do that, where we can do things that we'd never conceived of before, right? To be able to share data with each other in encrypted and not decrypted, to be able to keep, you know, keep, you know, keep sense of information segregated and yet have a shared view, right? The, the mental gymnastics in, the, in this particular innovation space are, are fun and, and, you know, and, and incredible. And really the ultimate outcome is it's creating the new possibilities to better configure what we want with what, you know, with technology that can actually do it. So, so the technology I, I is usually pretty great, right? But the problem is us. We're really uh, problematic creatures. Amber, <laughs> I want to hear from you. What do you think that we need to do in order to avoid balkanization of the internet and these like arbitrary borders that we impose? By all means, the internet is happy for whatever it is we want to use it for. Um, when you think about like laws and standards, what do we need to do to make sure that we have a free, relatively free and open internet rather than a balkanized internet? Well, the internet as it is um, does have borders and they reflect a lot of our existing geopolitical borders. So um, I don't really think that those are going away anytime soon. But what we can advocate for is free and, free and open technical standards and having universal structural support for strong cryptography uh, worldwide. And that's something that's incredibly contentious uh, as it is. And we've seen erosions of those rights over the last several years. So. And the more that we can advocate for uh, the ability to connect across borders and to recognize that the free and open movement of people and ideas and goods is no longer purely physical, um, but also digital, whether tokenized or not, uh, the more that we can prevent those kinds of negative outcomes. Gotcha. And we think about global technologies, right? Some of the first things that come to mind for me are Bitcoin and Ether. I know there are definitely people that would want to see either of those cryptocurrencies become a global reserve currency. Sheila, I'm curious to hear from you. Do you think that's a realistic aspiration and why or why not? So I've always seen, you know, uh, Bitcoin, Ether, I mean, privacy coin, you know, other kinds of coins. I've always seen them as a really important part of the option space, of the option set. In terms of serving as a global reserve currency, I mean, that's a pretty tall order. When you think yeah. about this sort of socio-political reality is underlying this, right? I think we can't divorce the concept of money or currency from soft power, uh, that mm -hmm. there is a connection there that is deeply historical and that really is not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. And I think that's what you see certain you know, jurisdictions kind of pushing against is this notion that there might be an erosion of the ability to engage in soft power and whatever, whatever that looks like, even sort of the, the threat is not meaningful if you don't have the economic power behind it, essentially. So, so that's why I think there's gonna be, there is already, and there will continue to be tremendous resistance against the idea of truly unlocking in that fashion. That being said, I think the notion that these are not extraordinarily important initiatives uh, in their own right, but also in, when, as part of the currency space, to me is, also, is, equally, is equally like, unreasonable. You know, of course we need things like this and not just, by the way, for illicit activity or whatnot, there are use cases that are going to be um, below the notice, let's say, of kind of big institutions that are still really important and that are deeply empowering. So I think it's a matter of, of seeing what happens over time. But I think to kind of building off of Amber's earlier point, I do think that we're entering a really challenging time politically. This pandemic, the new kind of wave of isolationism that we're seeing combined with the need to really cooperate with nations that may have been even 
enemies in some cases in the past, right? And, and to be dramatic about it, um, these are both realities that we have to kind of hold at the same time. And if there is a way that that translates into currency, I do expect to see that. And maybe, you know, maybe privacy coin, Bitcoin, either, maybe they're going to play a role in that. It just remains to be seen. Interesting. So for your role at the World Economic Forum, what are you hoping to accomplish this year um, with the Presidio Principles Initiative? Yeah. So what we've been trying to do since, since we really uh, launched our center out of San Francisco in 2017 was drive home this point that context matters, that we need to, we have an opportunity here with new technologies. We focus not just, I mean, my team focuses on blockchain, digital currency, data policy, but there are others, uh, uh, colleagues of mine who are focusing on other kinds of emerging technologies as well. We have an opportunity to, to do better than we've done before. And we're gonna make different mistakes. That's kind of inevitable, but let's at least not replicate what the problems of what came before. And that means both, let's not just digitize existing systems with all of their problems, but let's also learn from when things were new, new platforms and other things, the mistakes that kind of they embedded in to their operating and their operations and processes. Um, so what we're hoping to do with these principles is, is to really uh, engender that, to, to spur and catalyze movement beyond the work that we're doing through the work of our council, but really broadly across the ecosystem to say, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to think better, to do better, and to make sure that we are engaging in these kinds of considerations on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis to ensure that we do the very best that we possibly can, recognizing our own you know, intellectual limits, um, to build better systems that really benefit the entire world. Gotcha. David, I'm also really curious to hear from you. What do you guys hope to accomplish through your participation in this initiative? Uh, so we 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 uh, like like Amber we we jumped in right from the start to help with this. It, it, the the whole notion of of responsible technology starts with keeping users' rights and and the core principles of how users use systems safely, and how we you know we care for their care for their needs and rights uh, is is the best way to develop technology. And if you start there, uh, you're certainly off on on the right track. So so security by design from the beginning, user user needs by design from the beginning. Thinking about the responsible implementations from the beginning is just crucial. It's part of what we do every day with clients. Uh, so this was a this was a natural thing to get involved with to be able to take all of our learning uh, as you know over the past five six years uh, this tech this technology innovation wave for corporate enterprise and governments moved from an applied research state into you know into real real client use. Uh, th this was all, you know, this has been part of our dialogue for, for several years now, but we've lacked the, I think, clear articulation of, of these principles uh, that we can now commonly reference. And, and to, to Amber's point, right, the whole, the whole push to have open source, you know, freely accessible platforms and common, common technology upon which to build these new systems is crucial if we're not talking the same language and using the same principled understanding from the beginning to, to drive them forward, it'll be, you know, we won't get to the right place. So I think it was the right moment in time to take a step back, to, to be thoughtful about what we've learned so far. And to Sheila's point, right, we we certainly have stepped in it a couple of times collectively as an <laughs> as a, as an innovation community. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and and I think this was the perfect moment in time. We've got enough things happening, you know, real things happening in production, um, where where you know, real risk and and real needs and real you know real. Um, you know, in a real context uh, are underway. And so being able to now have a reference point for the principles that should drive it, I think has just been crucial and, and we're very proud to be part of this. The thing that you said that really jumped out for me was common language. So basically what you guys are all working to do this year is to establish a common language by which we can describe things that are constructive and helpful and things that um, maybe are less constructive or um, more risky and making sure that we're all on the same page about what those words are and what those definitions are, right? Yeah, and and I actually, Sheila, if I if I if I maybe peel back the peel back the curtain um, just a little bit on the process yeah. over the past months, and you know, and Amber, I mean Amber, Sheila, I, and the rest of the team, um, you know, I think uh, we we did a little bit of a fun exercise earlier this week and looked back at the first version um, yeah. and did kind of the basic compare, and as as you would expect. 
um, 80 plus percent of it, the, 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 you know, is, was there right from the start. It really was months of really focusing in on the language and not, and not just for the spurious kind of semantic, you know, word choice perspective, but, but getting the language right is, is critical. And it, and, it, and we are far better off if we are using common language. Cause again, this particular tech innovation space has been r riddled with inadequate language, people talking past each other, left, right, and center. Um, you know, I, I shudder even to, you know, to throw out some of the examples just cause it'll, it'll kick off, you know, all sorts of Twitter storms, but the, 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 um, you know, our ability to have common language is crucial. It's the basis by which we can, you know, we can actually work together to drive it forward. Yeah, that's right. And I think, uh, I just wanted to tag on to what David was saying there, that the common language is super important. And one of the things that we did was to go out to different communities of people who often use the same words but mean different things uh, and get their take on it. So uh, we posted these on GitHub as well to kind of reach out to the, the more technical community there and accepted some merge requests, which we did get, it was very exciting, um, of people, you know, wordsmithing uh, piece parts of that document. And that's been, been great to see because it's not just, uh, you know, how you say it or what you say it, but being accurate and precise to different people means very different things. I, I, I'm really glad that we've done that process. Yeah, definitely. And Amber, I'd like it if you could continue a little bit and explain to me when you're trying to design with the user safety and well-being in mind, um, what does that mean for you and, and how is that um, a deliberate approach? Um, well, I think it means that, and to go back to your very first question that you asked, to really um, go, it's part of this, the same question, right? Like, what does this mean? What does decentralized future mean? Um, and I, I think that what we're looking for is choice, agency, uh, consent, and an ability to not participate or to opt out without reprisal. And the without reprisal thing is important, right? It's not just um, if you uh, if you don't participate, then you become a more likely or under advanced scrutiny. And we're starting to see that more now. The more kind of privacy preserving tools, the more that we expect that you might be a bad guy or doing something bad. So um, helping people understand that these systems are not a zero sum game, uh, and it's not just a, a something that falls out of late stage capitalism that, that you know, the more data that you have, the better that it has to be. Um, but rather that we can give people freedoms and that makes them more loyal. And people having the ability to choose a provider should be part of a free market. And that having the tools and the ability to port your data allows people to come to you. Sure, it might mean your customers could leave you if you're not doing a good job, but it means that you can also aggregate market share as well. So if you can derive the same or better data insights as you would if you had all the data, but you can do it in a way where you can access actually more data without the same technical risk and the same legal risk. Um, then you're going to be in a better place and we're going to see better tools and, and more innovation uh, and probably more disruption from little guys too, but that's always a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Sheila, was there anything you wanted to add to that in terms of designing with the user as the pivotal point around which all things revolve? Yeah, I think it's just to say that I, I think this is a notion that's become, you know, it, it seems like it's commonplace over the last decade, let's say, you know, user centered design is not anything new human centered design is not really new there's a lot of we're building off a lot of that kind of work. I do think it's new in the context of decentralized systems, I think that there when you're your question becomes like, well, who is the participant in the system? And everyone has this, this, this role to play. And how do I think about the entirety of that space? I think it, it's, it's not that it's more complicated, it's just different. And so to us, we actually thought that the decentralizing, no, the centralized notion, the decentralization was critical to thinking about uh, ethics, if you will, in this new space and participant rights and participant um, ob and obligations for that matter. So I agree with everything that Amber and Dave, you know, said. Obviously, I also want to note that, uh, you know, part of the big challenge here was trying to pull together a set of principles that not only accommodated, co created to some extent, common language, uh, and were comprehensible across different protocol, across different applications, and different use cases, that really convening a group of uh, highly opinionated, <laughs> if I may say, uh, thinkers, you know, leading lights uh, in in the blockchain ecosystem and getting convergence on that without diluting it to the point where it was not meaningful. You know, and that was a tension. I think we were like, well, obviously if we issued something super high level and lofty, you know, then yeah, we, this would not be as big of a challenge, but we wanted to make them more actionable. So in light with that, we are actually constructing guidance documents 
that will help um, readers of the principles or signatories of the principles really understand how to ground them. So if you're working in enterprise blockchain, if you're working in Ethereum, if you're working on Bitcoin, like whatever it might be, and if you're thinking about a particular use case or application, you know, how, what do you, how do you really instantiate these principles in a meaningful way? So we'll have accompanying guidance that's not part of the core document, but that will help uh, people understand, you know, how to action these, because that is the point of this. It's not to just catalyze conversation, which is important, but actually to catalyze action as well. And to what degree are either government bodies or different members of the public sector involved with this initiative? Well, Amber noted that we did put this out on GitHub. And so we did have the developer community uh, with it was actually quite a bit of, of, of very helpful feedback in terms of what we were doing there. Uh, we've taken it around to various different communities in terms of um, uh, getting that perspective. For lay people, like the truly lay people, like my family members kind of lay people, you know, um, we haven't, didn't do really do a round there because we thought that it was mostly important and aimed at the people who were building these systems to be thinking about the user participants in these systems. Um, but we did take this to human rights organizations, to civil society organizations, and of course, governments, we have several on our blockchain council that have been through the rounds with us, and in some cases provided very detailed feedback uh, on what they could and couldn't you know, support or sanction in terms of this, and helping us provide, as I noted, that much needed context. The, you know, the laws around things differ, data protection differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. How do we accommodate that in the language here? So we're not necessarily grounding this in like GDPR or in, in any particular kind of notion of, of data protection or privacy, but we're creating a more universal um, set of principles that could be applicable across different places. So yeah, all those different groups uh, have been deeply involved in this process and in the very in the various rounds, as Dave noted, like at multiple times, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth and uh, there's been a flurry of activity, I would say, uh, around getting this to final. Amber, you've been in this space a really long time and I'm curious to hear as you've also been involved with this process, where you think that we're at now compared to where we were maybe three years ago and um, what has progressed and what do we still need to focus on if we wanna see this become a reality in terms of uh, shared laws and ethics for the ways that we develop technology? Oh gosh, um, well, that's quite a question. Um, right, sorry about that. I, no, it's okay. I remember, I mean, a couple of years ago saying, you know, if, if you wanna talk about when we're gonna have things that are like tokens and stuff that people are interacting with on a daily basis, we're looking at like a 15 year time horizon, right? So we're only a few years into that. Um, designing ethical systems is something that's been going on forever and ever, and it's an ongoing fight, but it's, it's a continued, it's a space where like the definition of what does that even mean, uh, whose ethics, uh, is always being redefined. So I don't think, you know, we're neither here nor there, other than that we see, uh, as we see an erosion of indi individual freedom and more of a rise of the sort of isolationism and authoritarianism in our traditional systems that follow on into our technical systems, like, that's a fight that's certainly uh, heating up. That said, I think that um, where I hope people are getting to is understanding that decentralization isn't just, oh, you all adopted my protocol, but rather it is about having all these different choices. I think what's happening right now um, with the pandemic is really interesting. Uh, it's interesting case study here in that all of a sudden everybody had to change things very fast and you had to just use what works and so we happen to be on zoom a lot of people are using zoom for a lot of things it's also getting a lot of backlash for a lot of privacy and security concerns right now a lot of people are looking for alternatives and you see people now having meetings in twitch or a meeting in a game somewhere the rise of discord and then uh, servers you know and the, for people that didn't use those previously and at the same time, you're like, well, what if I could self-host my own Jitsi server? So it's like private. So all of that choice, that is decentralization in action. It means that people are using what works for them and being able to connect across these various borders by using similar transport protocols and having different open connectivity across these sorts of systems. That's what will allow people to kind of get whatever they want to do done, which is talk to their friends. It doesn't mean that we need a like token-based video chat system to come save everybody. Yeah, for sure. David, I'm curious to hear from you as well. What do you think um, for 2020 this year is likely for us to see more usage of? I don't mean mass adoption. That's certainly something that takes a long time. But do you expect to see more um, banking technologies or more banks using 
uh, blockchain technology? Do you expect to see more insurance companies using it? Like, what do you think for 2020 is what we can expect to see as the low hanging fruit of this industry that will benefit from the work you guys have done laying out these ground principles? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, the, um, if I extend on extend Amber's comments and um, and try not to get myself in trouble with my marketing team because we're we're about to publish actually a piece around uh, we we've been looking at what is what's been accelerating, uh, what's been accelerated by this crisis and and if and I could boil it down to three things that there's certainly been this wave of benefits distribution focus how do how do we get how do we get money and 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 uh, and resources to the people who most need it? And there's certainly you know a, a just a ridiculously scaling number of those people. Benefits distribution, obviously, uh, you know, I think we we immediately jumped into immediate questions, um, uh, you know, with multiple governmental contacts around what's available to use now, to Amber's point, versus you know versus what do we have to rely upon you know the existing financial infrastructure to to achieve so I, I think there was limited amounts of things on the on the most cutting edge that we could use now um but the acceleration toward that end state i think is now just intensified so i think that's quite interesting on on you know something live right now that is just white hot at my my digital identity team is swamped under i mean just absolutely crushed under with demand and interest and need around how do we apply the notion of digital health credentials effectively to be able to enable us all to get back to work, right? So the whole use of self-managed identity to be able to take um, the the attested proof of whatever in you know in, uh, you know I've I've received the you know I've 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 had the I've had the you know I've had the virus or I've I've you know been in this context for this period of time the combination of things um, this is not a binary you know immunity passport or not context this is how do you take a complex set of information. Um, with user control, with privacy and security at the heart of the of the of of what needs to be put together, put that into context uh, and and be able to match you know match that user's control over information with that context to then drive the behaviors that will enable us to get back to work. Right. This is a this is a complicated space and the team is swamped under it. But there are this is one of the instances where actually the innovation wave is is timely in that we've we've actually started to implement and from an open source perspective there is you know with, with we we've based all our work right now on Hyperledger Indy and, and Aries. Um, you know, there's an open source common platform that we can build towards and do it faster. This is something we partner with the World Economic Forum on around known traveler digital identity. We actually, this is one that was more timely and we could apply current capability to really drive this forward in a different way. That's underway intensely right now. And then the third dimension, um, kind of a mixed answer in terms of what can be done now versus the acceleration. We obviously are, are you know, as it pertains to PPE and other, other dimensions, the whole notion of being able to look at a supply chain and be able to dynamically move things from areas of oversupply to undersupply. Uh, to be able to reroute mid 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 supply chain, to be able to change ownership, to be able to have the marketplaces to say, you know, I I need you have, let's get together and and figure it out, um, is uh, is again all accelerating and and that's kind of a tweener in terms of things that we can do immediately versus again accelerating faster to the future. So, um, it uh, you know I think if there's a if there's a silver lining to the to all of the struggle and and you know hardship that we're going through, I think. Uh, I think there's the impetus to to innovate faster, which is great. I think bringing it all the way back to the principles, I think we have to be very careful that we're that we're not, you know, that we're doing it thoughtfully and, and on a principle basis, and and you know, and with all, you know, without sacrificing the focus on uh, on doing it in a in a safe, safe, secure manner. So um, it's that balance, but you know, so, you know, a, a a silver lining of excitement in terms of we may get to the end state faster now. Gotcha. You've certainly given me a lot to think about. Thank you so much, both Amber and David, for joining us today. Thank you.